namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Aparuta de Sangamatasa Taura, ye sort of one tab, Amunjan to Satang. Evening, uh, I'm personally suffering a kind of state of shock because of the, I suppose you're aware of the news of the terrorist attacks in the United States. And, <clears throat> so this is probably the, you know, quite a, um, horrific and we've been sitting here looking at the stuff that goes on in our minds uh, uh, there, there was uh, unknown attacks and uh, the World Trade Building in New York City uh, two commercial airplanes were flown into them and uh, at it would be 2 o'clock British time, and another plane crashed into the Pentagon, oh. and all commercial airplanes, hijacked airplanes. So this is, and then another plane, there were four planes, one crashed outside of Pittsburgh. And so the United States now is on a red alert, <clears throat> and Britain also is on a Amber Alert. (laughs) (laughs) I just noticed the effect this has on you. (laughs) (laughs) The World Trade Towers were, were two of two towers in one building. It's one of the tallest buildings in the world, 110 stories. So the first plane was aimed directly at a suicide attack, so the first plane aimed at about the 80th story, and then sort of after another flew into it, and then eventually the, those buildings collapsed. And this was about 9 o'clock in the uh, New York in the morning. <coughs> so this is, uh, we realize uh, that, that the results of this are going to also be rather frightening because uh, they're really, of course, talking very tough. and uh, But they, there's no nobody and nobody knows who, who really did it. And there are no terrorist groups claiming that they've, they're responsible. Uh, it's a very kind of extraordinarily well-planned attack because it, it was uh, synchronized in a way that, you know, would take to, to hijack airplanes is, uh, you know, how they do it. And, and to, to be able to... Uh, to do it in in such a kind of skill, skillfully planned way, because this is this is a very frightening uh, situ- event, you know, the, the kind of worldwide repercussions. And of course, the the reaction, the, the official reactions are very. Uh, you know, um, you know, 
bravado and and the president of the United States and Tony Blair and all the forth, you know, saying we're not going to let them get away with this. <clears throat> Just thoroughly understandable in terms of our human reactions. <clears throat> And so, you know, like the the Middle East crisis, you know, with the Israelis and Palestinians, you see the the inevitability of of continued uh, suffering, where where revenge is uh, part of one's uh, emotional makeup, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth uh, reaction. I think we can all understand that. Like, I'm, I'm certainly. Uh, I can feel a uh, uh, desire for revenge when I, when something somebody has attacked me or my family or whatever. Um, but because of the you know the practice of meditation and the kind of contemplation of existence. To realize how to act on, you know, to perpetuate revenge. Like in Northern Ireland, it's a hopeless, hopeless uh, unforgivingness and seeking to get even with the, the Protestants and the Catholics. It is important to consider, you know, in, in just... Uh, you know, in, in our, because this is part of our humanity, we're, we're all quite capable of, of performing uh, uh, vengeful acts, seeking revenge, and desire to make those who suffer who made us suffer, or those who have humiliated us to humiliate them. And it goes on, and you, it ends up with what uh, destruction. As a and a kind of ongoing uh, feeling of wanting to to seek revenge, and then where does it stop? I remember this uh, etching I saw of the French artist Daumier of, of a, this battlefield where there's nothing left, just you know a few broken trees, and every everybody's dead. And, uh, and there's a skeleton sitting, leaning against the log, and it says, it was a sign across his front saying, Peace. <laughs> Is this all we're capable of? <laughs> Just keep it going until we're all dead. <laughs> Is the way to peace. And you can uh, even understand, you know, the, both sides in a way. When the when the terrorism must come from, uh, you know, a total frustration of various groups or people who feel who who feel they've been humiliated and demeaned and ignored and persecuted and. We see like a, a superpower that, especially at the present time, does not have any great concern for the uh, core elements of our planet. <laughs> and uh, and how easy it is to to uh, to blame. Uh, a powerful country for one's poverty or misery. And so, you know, we can justify terrorist acts because uh, even though uh, the United States calls them, you know, calling them names, cowards, and and uh, using all kinds of uh, 
vilifying words to describe these people that committed this act. <clears throat> So what does that do, you know, just to, to, uh, you know, call it, call them names because it's a natural reaction to want to, to, uh, make them, you know, the force of evil in the world. But I think the more we meditate, the more we're aware, is we're interconnected, you know, this isn't just one side against another, but, uh, in some ways, we're we're all uh, we're all in this together, and it's, uh, it's a way of a, a more visionary way of trying to understand, rather than just taking sides. And myself, coming from affluent country, and and uh, you know, you really, you know, I don't have really any kind of uh, understanding of what it's like to be, you know, like be brought up in a way that is uh, where you're constantly fed, uh, uh, you know, this resentment and hatred. There's a kind of, like you can understand, like Palestinians, uh, uh, being, some of them have for several generations have lived in kind of uh, refugee camps and been brought up to hate and uh, resent. And these, these suicide uh, bombers, this is, this is kind of a, this is another strange thing where you actually uh, are willing to kill yourself. And, you know, you're, somehow they, you know, to hijack a commercial airline and it's full of uh, passengers and willing to, to kill all of those people along with yourself. For what reason? You know, why would why would anyone want to do that? So you because I <clears throat> I I can't speak from from my own experience that in terms of yeah, if I notice, like in in my own background, being um, uh, brought up in 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 a kind of privileged circumstance, <laughs> uh, I've never felt uh, inferior on a, on the sense of racial, uh, as a, you know, as a race. That was never. You were always, uh, you know, in some ways, if you're white and Christian in the my generation in the United States, you, you know, the best. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember uh, when I was in university, and uh, I was uh, would work in the summer times to make extra money. And so one one job I took on was working in a tea cannery in. Uh, <laughs> in uh, in uh, Washington State, where I'm from. And so uh, one of my, my duties was to load uh, boxes of canned peas, green giant peas, <laughs> <laughs> on a pallet. You know, it was a pretty simple job. <laughs> and uh, the man that... that uh, that worked with me was a uh, was a kind of itinerant uh, laborer, you know, one of these American black that that kind of traveled around to various parts, uh, wherever you know, picking fruit or working in canneries or whatever. And uh, I was then only about 18 years old. He was must have been the mid 30s or something, and we became very good friends. We kind of bonded in our Mutual uh, working situation, helping each other, and uh, and I remember I was quite naive, an eighteen-year-old, quite you know inexperienced with life and 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 idealistic and naive, and so and coming from uh, the Northwest, from Seattle, it was not it was never a kind of uh, 
racially fraught place. You know, it was, uh, we had uh, a large black community that eventually migrated there during the Second World War to work in the Boeing's aircraft of the shipyards. And there were quite large uh, Japanese, Chinese, Japanese communities, but uh, racial discrimination wasn't particularly, wasn't, I mean, it, it existed in, in in subtle forms, but nothing like the American South. And my parents were very much against any kind of racial discrimination. So um, whenever, you know, come home from school and play and you pick up uh, kind of uh, not very nice words referring to various races, <laughs> uh, my mother would say, uh, you should never use Never use those words because uh, they're contemptuous. You should never say, use contemptuous words towards others. And so that never really stuck. You know, I appreciated that as I grew older. I could see how that helped just to get it from your parents, some kind of guidance in regard to to such issues. Because uh, some of my own uh, friends parents were racist, did have racial prejudices, and and I remember feeling quite uh, repelled by it. And because the, the golden rule, you know, being brought up as a Christian, the golden rule is do unto others as you would have others do unto you. So my, my mother would always, you know, get me to reflect on this if I was unkind to the cat or did something that wasn't very nice and she'd say uh, would you want somebody to treat you like that or that they know and then she said well yeah then don't do it to to others and it was a reflection you know that's quite a good re reflective teaching uh, and you can see children are quite capable of reflection because I don't think I was a special specially gifted child but but the uh, Definitely, it did sink in, you know. That's been a guideline for much of my life, is, is uh, you know, to be malicious and cruel, uh, intentionally cruel towards others or the animals or whatever. Uh, I would always remember, would I want to, to be treated, you know, I'm not, it's not that I never felt uh, these kind of emotions. <laughs> But in terms of reflecting on action, you know, it was uh, it did commit me to a way of of you know not not acting on such uh, negative or or impulses as I might be feeling. So that's a this that that kind of it can be kind of hackneyed uh, phrase <laughs> in the English language, the golden rule, but. But also, it's a, it's a very powerful, reflective statement. And and because of that, and it's oftentimes been difficult for me to understand how people can uh, do horrible things to each other. You know, it's seeming without any kind of remorse or consideration of the pain they're causing to, to the people they're abusing or the animals that they exploit or take advantage of. <clears throat> but yet if I'd been brought up in some minority group that felt abused, what would I be like? You know, if my parents had fed me a diet of <coughs> you've got to uh you know, say those people have humiliated humiliated us, abused us uh, taken our land, destroyed our culture, all that, and then, uh, and we we can't let them get away with it. Then I don't know what would I just, you know, if I would have, you know, if that was the message I was getting. And this black man that I worked with, you know, quite, we became quite quite good pals. And uh, so I said uh, one evening. Let's go and uh, have a 
meal in, in the town restaurant. And he said, oh, no, 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 I can't go. I, I said, why? He said, oh, I can't, can't go in those restaurants, in those cafes. And, and why? He said, oh, you, you black people can't go in. And I couldn't go in with you. <laughs> and I could see, you know, just his, uh, his whole response was, uh, you know, it, would, it never occurred to me because that that was, it would be a problem. And, uh, and I remember being quite moved by that, 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 that he was, uh, someone who, who knew that, uh, he didn't have that, that, that sense of, well, I can go anywhere, you know? I, I don't have any problems. I, even when I'm in foreign countries, I feel, you know, I can go anywhere. And I, I don't have a particular feeling of, of uh, that I'm, I'm going to be, uh, uh, persecuted. I remember being in Japan after, in the military, after the war, Second World War, and they, and uh, I went with a group of Japanese to see the war museum in, in Nagasaki uh, because we were one of the naval bases that our ship would uh, dock at was a port. This is after the just after the Korean War was a port in the southern island of Kyushu, called, and the port was Sasebo. And it was easy ride on a train to Nagasaki. And if I was in a sailor's uniform. With these Japanese friends, and we w went to the uh, museum where they have all the relics of the atomic bomb. And as I was looking at all these photographs of these, uh, you know, burned, horribly disfigured people, and and relics, you know, like one was a stone with somebody's hand print that had been melted into a. I mean, it was so hot that a stone melted and it left this handprint of somebody's hand in it and other kind of grisly things that that were taken and, and put in this museum and I suddenly had this incredible overwhelming paranoia. <laughs> and, uh, I, that's so obvious, you know, I, uh, the, you know, in American naval uniform and towering above everybody else is big American flow. <laughs> no way, I, I couldn't hide myself in the crowd. It seems to be the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said to the friend, I said, you know, I'm really sorry about this. You know, I feel so guilty. And the friend said, the friend said, oh, well, that was, you know, that was years ago, you know. We don't feel anything, you know. We <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, I wasn't getting hostile uh, looks either. It wasn't that any people were, you know, the people in the museum were were um, looking at me in, in, an, in a hostile way. But it was a sense of, uh, you know, being part of something that was, very cruel and uh, destructive to masses of quite innocent people, you know, because bombing bomb it doesn't select. <laughs> and uh, also, this is what happened like in the World Trade Center, isn't it? It's like these enormous buildings, one of the, they say it's one of the tallest in the world, at nine o'clock in the morning, everybody's, you know, probably there for working. And uh, in the financial district of Manhattan, and uh, one of the kind of landmark kind of American monuments, and this enormous building suddenly collapsing. And they even have pictures of people, you know, jumping out of the windows or you know, this building just kind of crumbling down with uh, filled with living people in it. And so you, you know, so these, these are the, you know, this, this kind of revenge and this, this destructiveness. And who really gets the, who, who gets destroyed are oftentimes the innocent, 
you know, quite innocent bystanders. And yet, our societies still promote these kind of actions, you know, I mean, we're, we're quite, you know, America's record is not all that pure either <laughs> in terms of being responsible for bombings and napalming and and uh, destroying uh, in the sense of when you see somebody as the enemy, is that you, 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 this being able to label that a group is the enemy, you don't see their humanity anymore. So we can be conditioned, you know, like war propaganda. You've got to make the people you're fighting into uh, demons and monsters so that killing them, it seems like a, a, the right thing to be doing. So I remember during the Second World War, the propaganda that we, I, was, I grew up during the Second World War, and and the, uh, the, uh, the propaganda was all to make the Germans and Japanese into monsters. So I remember uh, feeling this, uh, you know, they had posters, lurid posters. I remember one, still, I can still visualize it, <laughs> horrid poster of this, of this kind of barbed wire and... Uh, and these kind of <laughs> Nazis are dragging a woman off into a dark alley, and then the I mean, is this you know this is this is what's going to happen if we if they take over our country, and you know then you think of, when you're a little boy think of your mother and you think of, they're going to do that to my mother, <laughs> and this is a way of of you know kind of justifying the the bombing and the the uh, vengeful acts and and that's in a sense of of being right of God is on our side. this is what we have to do so this is war propaganda is uh, like that you have to to make out the enemy as, as subhuman or demonic. And and then the only thing left, you know, then you feel righteous in your attacks, in your vengeful attacks, and destroying them. Notice in in uh, the Buddhist teaching, what in the Four Noble Truths, it points to dukkha or suffering, which is a common human experience. And so, you know, this, if you think of all human beings suffer, then, then you're, you're looking at it in a different way. It's hard to imagine uh, these monstrous uh, enemies as suffering in any way. You've got to make them suffer in some way, you know, like harming them or getting even, persecuting them, torturing them, make them suffer. You don't think that they, that they suffer. If you start thinking of them as just like your own, you know, another human being that suffers, you wouldn't be able to to really harm them that much. You know, you would there would be an influence in which you you'd feel compassion. Just in here in Britain a few years ago, the the uh, the, uh, the, the James Bolger case, where this little boy was was uh, brutally murdered by two other little boys up in the north and uh, and they they arrested the two boys they were they were only the, the boy that the little boy that was murdered was three three years old or something like that and the other two boys kind of kidnapped him from a supermarket and uh, they were older maybe nine or ten something like that and they, they did a kind of atrocious act, and then they were put in prison. And now there, you can see the parents of the little boy that was murdered. Uh, now this, these boys have are now, you know, I think they're late teens or whatever, and they're and the the government wants to let them out to kind of free them from the prison, and of course. Uh, 
to do this, they have to completely change their names and identities and so forth, because there's still this uh, this revengefulness in this country, wanting to to get even with them. And the parents of the James Bolger, the mother especially, wants them to be <coughs> locked up in prison for a whole lifetime. You know, has no compassion for the murderers of her her own son, and only wants to see them suffer. So this, you know, I can understand this. You know, I mean, I'm on one level of, uh, you know, thinking what they've done is so terrible that they should pay a price for it by by being locked up their whole lives. Or use the more reflective mind begins to see the two boys. I don't know who they are, what they were like, but this was a horrible thing they did. But, you know, give them a chance. Because, uh, there's so many other factors to consider. And so you you have a more, more liberal sense of, uh, you know, concern and, and compassion rather than just taking a blind stand of, of revenge, hatred, and and uh, con- condemnation. And, uh, to be able to forgive, isn't it? to be able to to uh, recognize, when, and even if we do atrocious acts, that that, that in itself, the suffering of, of that is worse than being killed. I mean, from what I know now, I'd rather be killed than kill somebody. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to die anyway someday. It's just a matter of time. And, uh, but I wouldn't want to have to carry the memories of having brutalized and killed anybody with me, even if I could live, you know, never get caught, no one would ever know, and um, have everything, have become wealthy and successful, and then I'd still have that, that to remember, isn't it? those things hang around you, they, you, you know, they, they're you know, whether you're punished or not by the civil law or by the society, you punish yourself because you have to remember it. So I think I'd rather be killed than kill. In Buddhism, we have, you know, we contemplate this law of karma a lot, and uh, it's a simple kind of cause and effect thing. To do good, you receive good. To do bad, you receive bad. And then people come up and they say, well, I know this man that lived, uh, he was, uh, you know, I don't believe in that law of karma because I know a man, he's, he's never done anything good for anybody. <laughs> he's the most awful kind of criminal, brutish male, and yet he's wealthy, he has beautiful houses all over the world, big cars, uh, gorgeous mistresses, and uh, he gets invited to all the important functions wherever he goes, uh, received a Buckingham Palace, <laughs> and uh, See, he's, he's, he's living extraordinarily well. You know, he's not suffering, yet he's done terrible things. And so we equate maybe maybe uh, uh, that, that being wealthy and, and successful as some kind of reward. Or is it, you know? When you think of it, if, if you're wealthy and famous and all that, and yet you have, you know, you've acquired it through uh, criminal acts, you know, there'd be a lot of fear, you know, a lot of paranoia uh, that you, I mean, wherever you went, you'd have to, you'd always, you'd always have this, this, these, the furies in the Greek sense, you know, these, (coughs) these, uh, Furies that pursue you wherever you are, you can't get away from them. Or living as a Buddhist monk, 
where you, you know, you, you live as an alms mendicant. And, uh, you, you know, you don't have any money, any property. And, uh, and yet you, you, you know, you practice uh, meditation. And, uh, and with, uh, and, and with, and so you have a lot of joy and happiness in your, in your, in your mind. You don't, you know, don't have fear and paranoia on that level. To, the, 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 the furies are not a problem for me. Uh, even though the, the unskillful acts that I did, that I have done, you know, which were not all that much in terms of... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not, I've never been... My unwholesome acts were usually through uh, naivety, heedlessness, uh, stupidity, but never through... I don't think I've been malicious. I've never... I, I, I don't have a... I'm not very... I don't prone towards... Towards, uh, I don't like, I don't find any joy in in harming or seeing others suffer. So I, the unskillful acts of my life uh, have given me enough guilt <laughs> to where I know if I did anything more than that, I wouldn't even be unbearable. <laughs> Because the real, the real reward is a, is a is a clear mind, and its clarity is is a peace, not through the Domier's uh, etching, but in in terms of uh, you know having inner peace. Because uh, as you the effect, the power of your practice more and more as you uh, trust in it and cultivate awareness, then you, you find that your true nature is peaceful. You know, when you get to beyond yourself, beyond the conditioning of your mind, beyond the greed, hatred, and delusion, and the, and the, the various uh, identities and so forth that you might have, hang-ups you might have on as a person, uh, when you get beyond that, then I find that stillness and peacefulness, purity. So just noting that, and, uh, you know, is the result. If, if, if we, you know, if we direct our attention to what is skillful and and, uh, and developing uh, a life that we respect, you know, like in monastic life, for example, it's, uh, you know, I really respected uh, people who, who uh, were willing to live in, in the restrained uh, way of Buddhist monks and nuns. And so by putting myself into it, then I began to feel a lot more self-respect because uh, I, I lived in a way that I respected. When I didn't live, when I lived in more in a kind of way of just indulging my my greedy appetites and uh, impulses, I began to lose self-respect. You know, I was having lots of fun doing in this libertine style uh, that I used, that I thought would be liberating. I ended up feeling a lot of self-contempt. Uh, and uh, and inner and hatred to myself. So then, in moving into a monastic form, uh, I found increasing sense of what what we can might consider self-respect. So just noting, you know, how things work on us. And this is just from my own experience. Uh, so I can't stop speaking for anyone else. But but this this is been tested and tried by my own life, you know, see what what brings what brings me joy and peace and what makes me lose self respect. And then the choice is obvious. You know, it's not being imposed on me by 
you know, a puritanical system that that says, you know, you're going to hell if you don't keep all the rules and if you don't uh, behave yourself. On Judgment Day, you'll be sent down to the Avicii hell, unmitigated misery forever. Because <laughs> in Buddhism, Buddhist cosmology, you've got different hell realms. And the, at the bottom, at the, the pits of it, it's called Avicii hell. <laughs> And uh, that's where it's eternal and and unmitigated. You don't. In other hells, there's moments that aren't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes it, it's total misery, one moment after another. <laughs> so I mean, that's that's uh, the cosmology, uh, cosmological view, but. But also in Buddhism, you know, a Vichy hell is a Nietzsche dukkha, not just like any other condition. So it just seems eternal. I mean, if you ever fall into it, it, it seems like it's never going to stop. You know, it's forever. But actually, it's not really. <laughs> in the uh, Wheel of Life, it's... Uh, Tibetan model where they have the this um, you know this this wheel of life with the with the six realms of existence in it and then they have the you know, the highest realm is the one that's kind of ethereal realm is the deva realm where they they show kind of people that are very beautiful and they they play music and and everything is just light and beauty and uh, and, and, and pleasure. And then there's the uh, Ashura realm, which is the uh, jealous titans, the jealous gods, and they're they're powerful gods. They're gods. They're not demons, but they're ambitious and they're jealous. They're always they're always so jealous of the devas, and they're always trying to fight with the devas. And they can't stand to see people so beautiful and happy and so refined. And then they they. And they're 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 obsessed with power. And then in the uh, human realm is the uh, you know a lot of people like us, human beings who uh, we're not we, we can kind of reach these states. We can be we can we can have moments of titanic ambition, assure like behavior. And you can see it in the in no doubt in the business world and so. On. <laughs> Where politics, British politics, you know, where you, <laughs> you you want the power, and you anyone who's more powerful, you you want to knock them down. Uh, you're jealous of the rich, the, the privileged people, because uh, you know you, you want to take away their money and their privileges and so forth. It's certainly, you know, not uncommon mental state uh, within the human beings that I've known, and then. Uh, but we also uh, can sink into the lower realm. We can become, just, you know, just like the, the beyond the lower realms include like the animal realm, where your main uh, interests are procreation, eating, and, and sleeping. And uh, <laughs> that's a bit dull, you know. And you, then uh, and it's survival of the fittest. You know, you have one animal preying on another. Then, uh, and we can, you know, many many human beings develop more like that. You know, their lives are pretty much uh, food, sex, and sleep. <laughs> so then, uh, then uh, below that are the prekas, and they're hungry ghosts, and they're they're symbolized by these. There's a, they have these huge bellies, um, <clears throat> like as big as Mount Everest. Enormous bellies. And they've got this little skinny neck and tiny little head with a mouth. It's the the mouth is as big as the eye of a needle. You know, it's very tiny, and so they've got to fill this belly, this enormous belly, through this tiny little mouth, this, this small <laughs> or neck. And, and uh, of course, everything you put anything in, and you can't never get enough. And so, 
you're always hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so you live your life just just trying to you know to to to, to stem this hunger, this insatiable hunger, and this burning as you, the food you do take has to go down this long skinny neck. Everything burns down through it. That's quite quite unpleasant uh, realm to be born into. And then below that is a hell realm with fire and brimstone and all the rest. And then they have a Buddha for each of these realms. You know, they put a Buddha in each realm, what they learn from. So the um, the uh, in the Deva realm, the Buddha, you know, I think it's just playing an instrument. And in the Asura realm, he's got another something else to to. to and then then uh, in the human realm, he has an arms bowl. He's a monk with an arms bowl. And then uh, so this is this symbolizes the Buddhist to take on um, fulfilling humanity is through humility and and uh, you know being responsible for conduct and and. Uh, and, and you're in this, this mid realm where you you can you just you know I can identify with all these realms through my own experience. I've seen certain preta like qualities, certain demonic ones, certain deva ones, the titanic asura ones, animal type um, feelings and moods. <laughs> it's not that that I you know cannot relate or empathize with these different. But in the human realm, because we have, we have like as, as a deva, you have an ethereal body. You don't have a coarse body like this. So how nice that would be! I used to long to have an ethereal body. You know that that you could live on refined substances like ether, and you didn't have to defecate or do any of these awful things that, that our bodies do. You know, you. <laughs> Uh, and you, and you didn't smell bad, or you know, you did always this kind of perfume emanating off you for all oh, the fragrance and and everything so so nice and pretty and beautiful, refined, and and your body is that way. It's not not doesn't get tired, doesn't you don't have to you know it doesn't ever smell bad and never hungry and. Uh, just have this lovely, lovely appearance. Don't get old either. So, you know, that was kind of like I think many, many modern fashions and and uh, modern life is an attempt to to kind of create the illusion that we're Deva Das. You know, to always present ourselves in this kind of refined style of of glamour and beauty um, because we are quite embarrassed oftentimes by the coarseness of our own bodies, and it oftentimes humiliates us. Uh, if you've ever, you know, if you've worked with old people, or you know, you lose control over your your common incontinent. I think how humiliating that would be to to always be wetting the bed when you're 80 years old, or unable to control your things, and how embarrassing and how humiliating that can be for people. My father suffered enormously. It was humiliating and when he lost control to take care of his own body. <clears throat> then, uh, but in this human body, we it's like an animal's body, isn't it? It's not that much different. Uh, so we, we can relate well to animals because they, they, <coughs> our bodies are, are animal bodies. So we have, uh, you know, we, we're not that much different from chimpanzees, <laughs> monkeys, and things like this, and even dogs. You know, I mean, why do we, why do people love dogs so much? You know, what is it about dogs that that, that humans like? And, well, I find this is my my dogs have emotions similar to humans. You know, so <laughs> you can you can you can you can express emotion and 
And dogs are quite receptive, and they have. They can, you can hurt their feelings, and uh, they get jealous, and they. <laughs> and and we can relate to all that, you know. To to the they can they can become uh, naughty and devilish, and they can become very loving. And so uh, you know we we get on on the level of sharing that that realm we we. We, uh, you know, we we can uh, we find a kind of common bond with with a dog, cat, horses, in Thailand probably with elephants. <laughs> the people when well, they keep elephants, we get quite attached to them. It'd be hard to have an elephant do. <laughs> <laughs> And pretas, you know, I've seen the pretas side of myself, the hungry ghost. You know, like when you're, you're just obsessed with, uh, with the things. You know, alcoholism or sex, sexual obsessions or, or, or drug addiction or things like this. You get into kind of preta realm of uh, feeling just obsessed with this, this endless striving to have more because you never get enough. And uh, you, know, you have to have more, and you always, you know, the moment of satisfaction is so brief that you're always on the next one, trying to get something more. And then you know, the pits of hell, isn't it? Depression and and uh, just <coughs> just the total despair and and uh, these kind of things where we just sink in in into a hopeless state, or like a beachy hell, where there's there's no hope. When you're depressed, isn't it? You feel you're going, there's no way out. You're so low, so down that you can't, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no hope at all. It seems like forever. And, and then, uh, and that's, uh, and, and once you start having hope, then you, the depression starts lifting. Because hope is a positive. Anyway, you know, see a dim light at the end of the tunnel gives, a, gives you a direction. Well, these are just ways of, of contemplating these these different levels that we, that as human beings, we can relate to. It's not that that we're we're so refined that we can't relate to the lower realms, uh, and yet we can. Uh, you know, really feel a sense of, you know, we can also be very arrogant in the sense that we, we feel we're much better than the animals and and, and we can, uh, you know, the, the realms of suffering we can ignore when we're living comfortable lives like Devadas. You know, the, the, you can see in terms of living in affluent Western countries like this one how uh, how little the poverty of other countries affects us. You know how we, we read about it, we hear about it, but we don't have to even see it really. And we we can, uh, and our own life is a, a realm where we can just take for granted so many things of uh, security and uh, and uh, comfort, privileges, rights, and so forth. That that um, we, you know, we we oftentimes take for granted, and yet when you when you've gone to see, you know, in in countries that have a lot of poverty, it's the kind of just scraping together, just trying to get enough food to to feed your your, your family, and one of the, you know basic needs that some of these people have to spend their whole life just trying to uh, to, uh, to find enough to to get one meal or something to eat for not just for oneself but for one's family and so they're like a terrorist attack and It's easy to condemn such things because it is a stupid thing to have done, and uh, 
in a in a cruel and an atrocious act not to to uh, deny that, but also another part of me considers you know people driven to such acts. Why do they perform such acts? And and uh, in my own life, you know, I I've never been driven to do such things. You know, I've never, never had, never been pushed to the point where I would would do something like that, or even something lesser, some kind of violent act of revenge. <laughs> so reflecting on this is the, is the reflectiveness. We began to to have a much more compassionate understanding of the human condition. And this is very much what's needed at this time because the the uh, the the gap between the rich and poor is is increasing. And uh, the United States, of course, is, is represents the you know the ultimate success story. The 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 biggest economy, the most wealthy country, and and. Uh, where, where it, it's a symbol, isn't it? In uh, everywhere, as the kind of the what the only superpower they say that's left. Well, then this, of course, the this brings up jealousy, hatred, blame, you know, from those who who don't have such privileges or such opportunities. You can see now this the the movement of of Refugees and asylum seekers, you know, just trying to, these are Afghanis that they are trying to find a place to live, you know, and they they uh, and live in Afghanistan is is uh, is another hell realm. It seems this Taliban government is a, you know is really sick, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at least from the the news I hear, and they and the uh, just people trying to survive. And trying to get some place, and then they, they, you know, they're trying to get to Australia, where they've been refused entrance. And some of them have been allowed onto this island, Nauru, or some little coral atoll in the Pacific. <laughs> 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 yeah. I think it's, it's a great producer of fertilizer. <laughs> Uh, and and how unwilling you know uh, half of the countries are to I mean and how we don't want all these these poor people coming into our country because it, it's going to be a nuisance to us, isn't it? It's, it's uh, you know they cause trouble. They they're, they're not even probably not even educated and. And uh, I don't know, like we can, we can, you know, find so many reasons about, you know, not wanting to let these people in because then they're uh, Muslims, <laughs> and they're, and uh, you know, they'll just be a burden on us and things like this. So we, 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 uh, we want to protect what we have and our standards of, and I understand that too. But now, just reflecting on on just uh, uh, from the sense of the first noble truth of dukkha, then more and more, one one I find myself just just thinking only for myself or my own group uh, somehow diminishes when I contemplate the, the the natural condition that we all share. And I saw this years ago. I saw this book of photographs of war photographs and. Uh, I forget what what it was called. Was it from uh, the Biafra Biafra War in in uh, Africa? I think it was in the fifties, and it, it showed this uh, black woman uh, bare chested, and her breasts were all just shriveled up, completely dry, and she was holding this little baby who was trying to nurse on these dried up breasts. And uh, this, this this woman, you know, with such kind of anguish and bewilderment in her eyes, and this 
little, it's like a Madonna in a way, you know, of a mother and child. And I think especially women can relate to that, you know, of just uh, the futility, uh, the sadness of, of, of a woman, just a, an ordinary woman who's trying to nurse her own baby. And, and and is so starved herself that she can't even uh, produce any milk. And there's something so so pathetic and sad when when you look at that photo of this human condition of how you know that that uh, people uh, human beings like ourselves we begin to see a common humanity rather than all well, this black woman or you know, this African woman, <laughs> how we can dismiss because she's not one of us, not like us. Or when we look at the common ground of dukkha, its causes and the and the possibility for cessation and uh, a way of living that you know that we've the of non dukkha that that we we very much uh, have the opportunity to. To practice, to to hear, to develop in this way. But before you can really meditate, you at least have to have enough to eat. <laughs> now it wouldn't be any good for me to go start a, a kind of retreat center <laughs> in a place where everybody's starving to death. <laughs> Uh, yeah, basically, we need we need the material food before we can really take meditation that seriously. However, once we meditate, then if you know, I think I could handle starvation now. <laughs> At least I have I have developed skills in how to deal with with uh, with physical deprivation or pain, things like this, I'm not, you know, I would, I would know, I have some insight on how to deal with where if life goes in a certain way in which I'm persecuted, abused, or, you know, poverty-stricken, starving to death, I have skills of, of my, that I can use in understanding and reflecting in which I would, you know, hopefully not create. <clears throat> the anger and resentment and blame that I would do if I didn't have these skills. There's this uh, <coughs> book written by this uh, Tibetan Lama who who was, uh, I think, in a prison in Tibet, Paladin or Paladin Getsu, yeah, and he, he was, uh, how many years in a, 33 years, he was incarcerated in a Chinese prison and was, uh, you know, beaten and tortured, uh, you know, almost every day, and, uh, he managed to get out eventually, and, and came. Uh, he's been he's he got he's written a book and got on lecture tours. But but he that somebody asked him, what is the thing that most frightened you when you were in the prison being tortured and brutalized? And he says, my biggest fear that I might lose my compassion for my torturer. <laughs> So that, that's very moving to me. <laughs> uh, he didn't either. He managed to, you know, to get out without losing that. So we can see that potential in in ourselves, you know. You know when we, you know, how, you know, if we if we have this strength that comes from from this understanding, from wisdom, from knowing the Dhamma, from, from having a confidence in awareness and being able to to understand the suffering of our enemies or the people torturing us. This is possible. This isn't this isn't something that that is impossible to to uh, 
encourage the human human beings like ourselves to move in that direction. At least that's the way I want to move. <clears throat> don't know what I'd do if people started torturing me. But I've worked on just uh, the, uh, the 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 torture I get living here at Amravati. <laughs> <laughs> So it's it's not you know people aren't aren't uh, you know doing physical tortures on me but but uh, <laughs> but just working with the 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 irritations frustrations and and that the problems of living in a community you know I think I'll start on that level some way that I can you know before they they nail me to a cross or or <laughs> or put me on the rack. Oh, if I can just learn to deal with with the the my uh, hurt feelings, the my disappointment, my my irritation, frustration uh, in in this community, I will do that, and, and and see that is at least you know working on just that level of what's actually happening to me, rather than waiting for the big moment when they nail me to the cross. We may never nail me to a cross, but you know, so it's, uh, <laughs> at least I hope they never do. <laughs> They'll put me on the rack, but but at least you know, and there's just the nitty gritty frustrations and and uh, hurts and uh, that of of daily life. Even you're living in a monastic community of very good people. You know, we live in uh, you know. And, and you know we're all kind of here. We're all here to practice, and we're all very kind of morally uh, trustworthy. And uh, and uh, you know basically we we all aspire and and uh, want to be good. And yet, in spite of that, even though you live in a community where all the members are basically good. Uh, Spiritual practices, there's enough here to be ir- bloody irritating, <laughs> <laughs> and there's, <laughs> there's enough that goes on to be, <laughs> to be hurt and offended and upset and uh, and fed up and and averse. And so this, you know, I decided to, to to work with the way my life is rather than. <laughs> Then to uh, well, I did I did go to Tibet a couple of years ago, <laughs> and uh, fortunately they didn't incarcerate me, but they they kicked me out of Tibet. The Sugato, the other monk, and we were that was heartrending, and we went and we, we we traveled with this group, the six uh, lay people from England, and then these Sherpas, and we'd been trekking in through Nepal for quite a few days and you know, you're moving closer to Mount Kailash and and, it, and it's so beautiful, you know, you're in this beautiful kind of wilderness from the Himalayas. We had got into Tibet and then at the immigration station they said, no monks allowed and then they, they, they we were taken by armed guard back to the, you know, in a land rover crushed into a land road with several other armed guards and chucked out on the border with two Sherpas. And uh, this tremendous grief, you know, and we left and with the six lay people we were traveling with and even the Sherpas, everybody was in tears. You know, it's like being ripped apart, you know. This, this kind of goal. We're all going to Mount Kailash, and we've been through a lot. It's hard work, you know, climbing up mountains and and all that in the high altitudes, and and you you kind of easily bond in such uh, situations, and then suddenly ripped apart. And of course, I was the the whole focus of this pilgrimage. It was because of me that all the others went. So. <laughs> 
here, here was even more kind of uh, grief, feeling of grief. But that gave me a chance to work with that, isn't it? This is, you know, I can survive that. <laughs> work with, with what happens rather than, you know, I mean, that was an extreme one. But daily life in Amravati also gives me enough <clears throat> practice, practical situations to, to, to be able to, to uh, transcend them, to learn, to, to forgive to to uh, understand, to have compassion, to develop compassion. So that's enough for this evening. And uh, now that you know, the, it's going to be interesting uh, what the United States will do. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's frightening, you know, because of the power of that country and and uh, you know the incredible weapon power of that country is very frightening and you know that if how they're going to use what they're going to do is, is you know no, they, it's too new and nobody's saying but the, one feels only uh, trepidation around that because they're not into forgiving the Americans. <laughs> what do you think of the American reaction? It's been very kind of get them. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's understandable, you know, it's a big shock. I mean, we're going to get you, you know. But they don't even know who they're after yet. Mr. Martin, you said that you were both of you and you were going to kill each other. Completely collapsed. You've got 10,000 people living there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the Pentagon? The Pentagon, a, play, a part of it uh, was, is, is it? supposed to be still on fire was the plane flew into the one side of the Pentagon and the whole country is on red alert and there's no flight to the United States. I have a daughter that lives in Yeah. She didn't work in the world. World Trade Center is down in the financial district, isn't it? It's quite near, is it? I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, that the building itself, it didn't seem to harm the. So much the area is it? they think they, they they don't know how two planes even could could make a building kind of implode and so they they suspect there might even have been bombs in in the building itself did they have some estimate as to how many people were killed they don't you know it's just unknown. <laughs> they're not saying, they're not even on the news, they won't say. 
They don't think it's that because it's too smart. Too smart. <laughs> it's too 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 well planned, and I don't think. And I, 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 yes, there are and no, it was not. It had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. But also, they were celebrating it in the Gaza Strip. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a particularly wise thing to be doing. <laughs> In the, and they were in America. The, I heard the, the <laughs> one was the United Airlines, another was uh, American Airlines, and I uh, think two were uh, Emirates. And from Boston. And so in the And Tony Blair has stopped all plane traffic over London now. Relief. It's a cycling thing because in America normally there's such a high level of paranoia. Um, sort of what we would regard as very minor terrorist incidents spark off this wave of paranoia, but something of this scale, you know, and hitting the Pentagon. Yeah, it's, it's the world uh, yeah. trade towers is just staggering as to how America will respond to that. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody can touch what I go, you know, it's very well protected. But now we can. Mm -hmm. I think they just did it to disrupt this retreat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for not hearing it. I know when this call. That's one way of looking at it, though, isn't it? <laughs> one, one shocking event. I remember it. What well, I taught years ago. I was invited to give a retreat. Ten day retreat at Wat and Pa Nana Chat. And so I started out in the evening, the first evening, and I said, uh, gave my introductory kind of reflection. I said, you know, we're all here in a safe place, and, and uh, you know, no, no storms, no tornadoes, no earthquakes. Uh, uh, we can count on just having a peaceful time. Just so our practice is to just be mindful, meditate. And that very night, they had an incredible windstorm, a cyclone. And, <laughs> and it blew down some of the houses in the village. <laughs> and, and in the Kutia, the hut I was staying in, I could feel the wind keep lifting it up. You know, I thought it was going to be blown over. So I've never said that again. <laughs> 